I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Simon O'Rourke. Simon, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Um, so you've been doing wood sculpting for quite a heck of a long time now. Yeah. Um, one of the things I don't know a lot of people have been interested in is how, how did you actually get started into it? Because I know a few people know a bit about your background, hmm. but where did it all start from? So it started really at, with a passion for art, I suppose. Um, I was I was obsessed with art as a kid, and I ended up doing. Um, I went through the education route that most people go through, but I did a graphic design BTEC, then a foundation year in art and design, and then went to uni to study illustration. So illustration has got nothing to do with wood or chainsaws. So, <laughs> um, But after my degree, I realized that I was a bit disenchanted with illustration. It's a really difficult thing to kind of get a job in as such, so needed full-time work. And during the final year of my degree, I'd been working uh, as a groundie for um, just on Saturdays for this guy, a friend of mine, who'd started a tree surgery business. So I started getting really into that. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. Loved being outdoors, you know, this, and learn, started learning the trade, did my cert arb, night school, and, and it, was, it was like a... a I really, really enjoyed it, but then it was a bit of a light bulb moment when I saw somebody carving with the saw. <laughs> so can you remember what the first item actually was that you ever carved? Hey, it was a mushroom. Yeah. What's the easiest thing to do? Yeah. Just the top, exactly. Down, yeah. It? Yeah. So I tried to make it look like a real mushroom. I tried yeah. to kind of do a little bit of a frill on the underneath and stuff like that. And at the time, it's like. It, I hadn't even heard of carving bars. I was using yeah. a an old O two four with a <laughs> with a sixteen inch standard <laughs> bar on it. So it's like you know, kickback danger yeah. everywhere, you know, with with stuff like that. So um, especially using a full chisel chain, the kickback's even worse, isn't it? Yeah. So, Frankly, you switched all that. I know you got your own range of bars now as <clears> well. Yeah, yeah. Well, the um, it's it, it's it's more a case of they. They could brand it with anything, and I, yeah. I, I thought it's a bit more advertising in it. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, name on it. Yeah, somebody had suggested having a signature bar, and yeah. and I really like the Samora bars. That's yeah. that's what I'm what I've been using, and they're they're uh, they're great. I got to tour around the factory when I was in Japan, mm. and uh, and see how they're made. And it was an incredible experience, but uh, yeah, it was good. I was gonna say, so I've gone around the world. I know you've. You go to Germany quite a bit, and you go to a lot of international yeah. uh, carving competitions. Where's the most exotic place you've done the carving? Um, I think it's probably got to be Japan, to be honest. It's just such a such an amazing country. And when yeah. I was there, it was um, <clears throat> uh, the first time I was there was two thousand and was it two thousand and six was the first time I was there. I was invited for a, a competition that consisted of. Uh, a two-hour competition and then a three-hour competition. So it's like really quick fire happened yeah. over one day, and um, uh, and I was there for a week, and it was, so it was a really kind of quick process in that way. But um, that was a great experience. Uh, so what was it that you carved over there? Can you remember? Well, um, the two-hour competition they gave us themes. So oh, yeah. the, the two-hour competition was. Um, I can't remember what the theme was, but I ended up carving. Uh, everybody had exactly the same size log and the same two chainsaws, and it was like it, it was so consistent. Yeah, no more consistent than any other competition I've been to, to be honest. But um, nice piece of Japanese cedar, so really soft to carve. And um, I created a tree out of two parts and put it together, but the the tree had a an arborist at the top, like like leaning back yeah, on his yeah. rope, like a small, really small <laughs> lollipop type canopy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, arborist leaning back on his rope and kind of Just looking, putting outwards. His, looking outwards. <laughs> and I think I, I called it, I can see your house from here. <laughs> so I know a lot of your carving, since you start out doing the mushroom, mm. you've gone on to do some of the most recognisable carvings in the world now. Mm. Um, one of your biggest carvings this year, <laughs> which you probably had to speak to everyone about, it was just having to be the Welsh Dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did, they, how did you get involved with that? Uh, it was a commission. I mean, the, the guy the guy contacted me, the customer contacted me, and he, he said, he said I've got a big oak branch that's come out of a tree. Um, it's the size of a 
size of the tree itself, yeah. you know. Um, it's about probably 30 inches across. And it had fallen out and, and just crashed into his woodland. It was up on a bank. It's just off the A5. So you can see it from the A5, which is why it's caused so much controversy. Yeah, because I've read, I've read a couple of news stories of people pulling over the cars and causing <clears throat> and Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Well, it's a fast bit of road, and there's this tiny little lay-by that fits two cars. So yeah. <laughs> so I, I was pulling up in there every day, carving it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, the guy contacted me and said, I want to make this drag, and I, I want to do something. And I... Uh, and I said, have you any idea what? And he said, I, I think a dragon would be quite nice because of the location. <laughs> so he uh, he sent me a few photos of it. And from what I could see, it was on a fairly, it was resting across a wall. And I thought, okay, that's that's fine. You know, we can do that. When I got there, it's like up this 45 degree bank and this it's a rocky outcrop that it's sitting over. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of leans out over the over the rocky outcrop and you kind of, get this impression of it leaning right out. Yeah. So when I got there to actually properly assess the job, I thought, oh, it's got to be, if I'm going to do a dragon, I've got to go all out on yeah, this because be of, of where it is. It's got to be big. So I was like, I'd priced it in at six days. I knew I could kind of do it, do something decent in six days. But what I ended up doing was way more ambitious than what had been in my head at the start. <laughs> <laughs> you think, oh, I'll just do a little dragon, I'll make it look nice, and then before you know it, yeah. wings, yeah, exactly. it, tails, you name it. I was just like, it's worth going the extra mile for yeah. this one. Uh, How just... long did it take until the bank was ready? So it was six days, yeah. and then uh, I think about four weeks later, somebody had managed to hang on one of the wings and break it off. So no. I... Uh, I had to go back and repair it, but so I had to go back and repair this wing. But what I actually did was I went back and I didn't only repair it, I did what I'd wanted to do with the wings in the yeah. first place, which I didn't have time to do, which was refine them a bit more. Because you might notice in some of the early photographs of it, the, the wings literally are just planks layered. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it just wasn't quite as organic looking as I wanted it to be. So, so I thought, yeah, that's... Uh, Make, make add, the effort. Add the, add the bit of and the, to it. the client was great. He paid me the extra day to come back and oh, nice. do so that. So it's nice so. when you can go, I just want to do a little bit more. And the client goes, oh, I can't quite justify you doing that. Yeah, that. Oh, quite. It's, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, just the yeah. amount of interest and exposure that you gained mm. from it. Yeah. I know um, one of the things when I was chatting to Paul Hicks at still was you're a bit concerned of being called the Welsh, the, <laughs> the Dragon Man of Wales. Yeah, think, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's gone from... Doing like the, you've got a um, dragon as well mm. that you can ride on as well. Can't think of it. Yeah, Hemlock, Hemlock, the Hemlock. Dragon, that's yeah. it. So you did the Hemlock, then you did this <clears> one. Yeah. And then I think it was back in November you were commissioned to do a certain <laughs> item that we can now actually talk about because it was yeah. finally broadcasted in like the Dragon's Egg. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it when that commission came through. It was, uh, yeah, when you get a. When you get a call or an email from a, a marketing agency in New York saying, we've got a client who wants yeah. to work with you, but you've <laughs> got to sign this NDA first. <laughs> I was like, okay. So first thing I did was go onto their website and look at their client list. Yeah. <laughs> and it was HBO, H- HBO was Thrones. among them. And, and I was like, I hope it's Game <laughs> of Thrones. But it's like John Lewis or another of the, yeah. I was like, Next Christmas advert, <laughs> right. but I I didn't. Uh, I was I was thinking what what what's it going to be, you know? But then the email came through, and I was uh, I was just flipping, you know, like, pinching so myself. Excited, I was yeah. like, oh, no, that's amazing. So they said, yeah, our client HBO have commissioned a commissioning eighteen artists yeah. uh, to produce something from the series history. So we're going to send you a prop from the season's series history and uh, we want you to create something around it so or we'll reimagine it if you like yeah. so i got sent the dragon eggs and um, they asked me to create this new casket for them as if it was being gifted to daenerys for the first yeah. time and um it was great it was amazing i had to so right from November. Yeah, just keep <clears> staying completely <throat> quiet. To keep quiet about it. I don't, I've got I had a few friends who I kind of, uh, who I knew would appreciate it, yeah. who I invited around to the workshop and, and said, uh, oh, you know, come and have a look at yes. this. <laughs> so 
Because when you <clears> when you <throat> when it finally came out, I think it was January, February time. You know, uh, yeah, it was mid Feb, mid Feb. Yeah, I was, I was like, oh my god, I know that guy. He's just done something for HBO. <laughs> What? <laughs> and he just caused absolute havoc in Wales. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, this is getting absolutely insane. Yeah. Like, me and you, we first met, I think it was the 2017, 2018, or i might have been. Yeah. So we just had a nice little friendly chat. Yeah. And then it was kind of, I think we could do a quick interview with him. And we were doing the interview yeah. with, yeah, and um, one of the other guys from the demo stage, Tom, was like, he was doing that in the background. So it was like, can you hurry up? Can you hurry up? We've got, he's in, just about to do a presentation. I was going to rip the mics off, yeah, and then you were straight into ah, it. To ah, do yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you're going to the Orb show again this year? Yeah, I am, yeah. So you're going to be partnering yeah. with Still again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got any ideas what you might be doing at this year's Orb show? I don't actually know. I haven't, I haven't decided. I think I think it would be, be wrong not to at least carve a little dragon. <laughs> I think I, I've got to get something in there. That's uh, Yeah, I, I reckon that would be quite cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know what else because they they only give me an hour a day, yeah, uh, for the for the demo. So it's um, it's it's quite a nice one. It's a it's a quick carve, really. You know, it's 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 only something small, and then they'll auction it off for their charity. Yeah. Um, uh, either that or they'll keep it. It's it's up to them what they do with it. But uh, so when it comes down to you thinking of your next know, creations, have you ever? Being able to draw something but never being able to get it into the piece of timber, how you first visualized it? Um I think I've I've had a few really ambitious ideas which I've realized later that just aren't possible yeah. or you know, are a little bit too I think most of the restrictions are to do with the strength of the timber. So it's like you can't put something delicate across at the cross grain yeah. because obviously it's 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 weak, isn't it? So um but then that's you just start getting creative with additions. Um, and remember the first time I really started thinking about adding bits on and and creating something that extended outside of the log was I think meeting uh, a mate of mine from um, the west coast. He's based in Oregon, a guy called Chris Foltz, and he came into wood carving from the ice carving industry oh, yeah. and in ice carving it's all about additions because you you start with square blocks yeah. so you build the blocks up and you can kind of you can do whatever you want you can you stick it together with water effectively and it freezes again um so he he come into a wood carving competition he'd dismantle the log create loads of bits and reassemble it into something massive <laughs> and i was like do you know what i'm <laughs> Quite intrigued about this. So I had, I had a good chat with him, and and he it was just a completely different way of thinking. So uh, I started trying that out in a few different bits and pieces, a few of my uh, competitions and a few of the events and stuff. I started trying that out. So with these sculptures, what has been the most technical sculpture that you've ever created? Um, difficult to say, really. I think one of the most technical it's probably um i reckon the the tree in the museum of somerset so i built a tree yeah. out of bits of tree but the 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 complicated bit about that was everything had to be fitted through a double doorway so i had to create branch sockets and and kind of make it look natural in its growth yeah. but like actually carve it into something that's that's that that looks like a proper tree has grown but so that the center uh i mean the tree must have been um, the actual sculpture is maybe 28 inches across at the base so it's a big old piece it's still quite a fair size fair, yeah fair size base to <clears> yeah and uh, i ended up having to uh um hollowed the whole thing out like a toilet roll yeah. <laughs> and uh because uh, I, I wanted to hide the joints as well. One of the things I did was I I, I cut in, uh, I carved the thing as a solid piece, and then the points where I wanted to sever it, I severed it, um, I, I kind of cut in on an angle yeah. so that when it went back together, it sat down and, and you couldn't see light through the gap. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, so little things like that make a big difference to to kind of thinking ahead about 
the joints and stuff like that. Um, so that was probably that was one of the most six and a half meters tall with a oh, like massive. a I think he had a ten meter wing uh, wingspan. <laughs> Yeah, 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 flipping <laughs> obsessed with them at the moment. Uh, yeah, it had the yeah ten meter crown spread, including all the little fiddly branches yeah. that I'd added in. But every single branch had to be kind of plugged in, <laughs> if you like. So. so, what's been your most memorable carving that you've done? Um, well, I think the dragon's blown everything out of the yeah. water. To be honest, it's just just insane the the reaction I got from it. I knew I'd get a good reaction from it, but. Yeah. I I didn't think it would go viral like that. Like, Do you know how many people last came across it? Until, well, <laughs> it's um, going to be easily into the millions, not this day. I think so. Yeah. Um. I think what what really kicked it off was it got a great reaction in the first place. I mean, yeah. When I first put it on social media, it had two thousand shares within twenty four hours, and the shares are okay. Yeah. Likes is. You know, yeah, well, shares did, but shares the it's, after that. it's the impressions after that are insane. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I think in that first 24 hours, it the reach was 600,000 people, and you just think about the, the knock on effect yeah. on that. And then, uh, I've got the North Wales police to thank for <laughs> their tweet. <laughs> They they tweeted, we love the dragon, but please be careful. It's yeah. a d- dangerous road. There's already been one small collision and a few near misses. And it's just like, uh, and and that, the Daily Post newspaper yeah. got hold of that. Their headline was, dragon causes traffic chaos. And then <laughs> all of the newspapers jumped on that. So I was in the Telegraph, the Guardian, it's trending on BBC yeah. website for a few hours. So you got on the um, five live as well that you got on Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. Five live insane. interviewed me and it was just insane. And uh I was away at the time as well, so I was, I was getting well, that, calls. A little bit of relief to ask getting what calls in Greece. <laughs> can we interview you? I don't know. It was like flipping heck. Come on, Oliver, can you wait till back? <clears> yeah. It's so it was uh yeah, it was amazing though, and that 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 just yeah. you know, that that did a massive amount for me. I ended up going from having a month's work ahead of me to six months work ahead of me within a two week space. So it's just Money insane, demand. insane. I was going to say the future stuff, um, one of the other, you're literally all over the place at the moment. You're on the radio, hmm. you're international, and you've also just recently been on the BBC as well. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. You got to uh, meet Noel, no, not Noel. Uh, Nick Knowles. Nick Knowles. Nick Knowles. There you go. You're yeah, close there, yeah. Yeah. What must it be like when you get a, a phone call or email from mm. you saying, "Do you mind just popping onto the BBC for an episode?" Yeah. <laughs> um, it was it was pretty cool. I, to be honest, I, I was a little bit dubious at first because I know I know how a lot of these programs work, and sometimes it can be like, you know, how are you portraying art and how are you. Yeah. Then and basically their 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 sales kind of pitch to me of this is what we're doing, this is the way what we're trying to do. We're trying to encourage people that they can commission an artist rather than buy something off the shelf. I was yeah. that sold it to me to be honest, because yeah. I was like, Well, okay, right, yeah, I'm onto this because you you're doing doing the right thing or at least the attitude's right, you know, however yeah. it comes across. And um <clears throat> the the whole process was really uh, a good experience to be honest um they they didn't take the mick they they really they they looked after us as artists mm-hmm. so it's like the in the pilot series that they did 15 episodes yeah. 45 artists so three artists per episode and um so obviously I was one of them uh, that that they asked, and um, it was it was something that was really uh, kind of there was something really nice about the way it was filmed, and the the in my episode certainly the client was lovely, and it was it was just a really good process, but kind of filmed over three days, and knew that if I got through to the second round yeah. where you actually make the piece then I'd need to know that I've got time set aside for it. Yeah, so it, not <clears throat> the whole time the BBC schedule to be uh, it, it took my um 
I did end up having to move a job because I'd forgotten about it and booked something in. So, so, so I ended up having to move a job to kind of accommodate yeah. actually doing the piece. And So just going back to working on the BBC, one of the other things that got my missus really excited was mm. when you turned around and went, oh, this is Dickie Bow's made of wood. <laughs> now, hopefully I'm going to get married in the next two, three years. Yeah. One of the questions I've got to ask, can you make me a wooden Dickie Bow? Yeah, of course I can. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always see your carvings and I think... It's not just a work of art, it's skill. It's a, it is a labour of love mm. that goes into it, because it's not yeah. a case of picture and sort of go for it. Yeah. I know one of the things that you really like talking about is how you get started with everything of, like, mm. how do you go about choosing the timber and what, where do you get your inspiration to do your next design from? It's a, it's a really difficult one, because a, a lot of the time I'm just commissioned to make stuff. Yeah. From, so, so sometimes the... On occasion, the design is dictated to me. On occasion, the most of the time, people say that they've got an idea and they want to know how I can kind of interpret that idea. Um, but uh, sometimes I actually get to do stuff for myself, so yeah. it's a case of going right. Uh, what do I want to make? I've got this idea. Let's let's kind of do something fun. And I'd seen uh, with the dicky bow, uh, I'd seen somebody, uh, a friend of mine in Germany, a guy who runs a, a massive event each year called the Husky Cup, and he'd um, he'd done the a series of wooden bow ties, really simply carved, you know, like really um, uh, rustically carved. Uh, it wasn't really detailed or anything yeah. like that. And I saw them and thought, oh, I'd love to make one that really looks like material. Yeah. So I um I went and uh, uh kind of I I, I don't know I, I think my first one was made of a piece of oak and I I thought I'll give this a go and really enjoyed it and I thought oh this is great um so I made a few more because I wanted to give myself some choice so <laughs> I just I made them for me to begin with because yeah. like I, I I do black tie do's occasionally yeah. uh, um because I um uh I get asked to do a lot of charity work as you can imagine it's it's something that's really visual and saleable so uh, i get asked to do a lot of charity work so what i usually do is choose two or three charities a year yeah. and um if it's if it's somewhere that do like a a black tie ball type thing um that's that's a room full of uh, i mean to put it crassly it's a room full of potential customers yeah. for me but the other thing is it's 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 great because it's raising money for the charity as well. So I've either auctioned a day of my time or I've auctioned a, a sculpture that's going to be worth whatever is bid. Yeah. And um and that that's worked really, really well in the past. So it's to those kind of events that I'll wear the, the wooden yeah, dicky bow, you know. So um I've still got quite a few left. I did yeah. I did try and former i've got a website called woodenwearables.com right. <laughs> but um i did try and kind of make a business of it and i realized <laughs> very quickly that i was spending way longer on these little tiny bow ties yeah. than i was on bigger carvings and you just can't charge the amount yeah, yeah. that i'd need to like 20 pound for a dicky bow is acceptable but <clears throat> well it's gonna be about two thousand pound because i spent the best part of a week to get it <clears throat> yeah exactly yeah so it wasn't really viable as a as a yeah. proper business but it was a bit of fun yeah. so do you actually know how many carvings you've done since day one roughly oh my word i don't know <laughs> um i reckon if i if i say i've averaged kind of if i've averaged two a week yeah even over the past well just 12 years of being full-time uh you're talking well over um well i don't know how many that is to be honest <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm losing track it's a lot uh, it's uh but like sometimes i've done a lot multiple small ones and yeah. things like that you know and uh, so it's a lot it's 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 in the thousands but i have no idea those are the How many? many thousands of carvings that you've done. Is there any that really stick in your mind where you think you've either gone up a level in terms of your career, your skills, or where a carving stayed with you for a long time before that's <clears> meant, <throat> meant a lot mm. to the actual person who's, who's receiving it? Um, I think in terms of pushing me, um, 
the competition pieces I've done have probably pushed me the most because that's been my excuse to try something that's really out of the box and 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 exciting. Uh, and the human form has always been a passion of mine in terms of carving. And yeah. that's, it's it's one to aspire to because we see people all the time. Uh, so you automatically, you know when something's wrong on a carving of a yeah. person. You know if the arms are too long. You know if the head's too big because you see people all the time. But um, when you're, so it's really challenging to do an accurate human form and especially with a bit of movement and, and things like that. Uh, so that's always a favourite of mine to carve, uh, and some of the uh, some of the early ones I've done have kind of stuck in my memory of like you know being a massive learning curve. Um, the giant hand at Lake Vermwee that yeah, I carved. Yeah, we want to get onto the hand. Um, I remember one of the stories that you told me was you was trying you was trying to think right how can you do the hand and you're driving along and you have your hand on the steering wheel and you just start to stay on your hand yeah and about two seconds later you just you end up grabbing the steering wheel yeah. and you're too busy staying on your hand to try and figure out all all the different textures yeah the wrinkles or something yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Well, yeah it was it was just yeah it was one of them where i i did it it's a it's an exact replica of my yeah. hand that one and and yeah i was i'd spent like the whole Two or three weeks before and staring <laughs> at it. Going, going, right. How can I make all different consoles, getting the knuckles? <clears> yeah, exactly. Stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's amazing when you when you start looking into uh, things like the human form. It's like you realise how much you don't know. Yeah. Like the the direction of the muscles and and like how it all fits together and and like when when someone's standing in a relaxed manner, one hip's slightly higher than the other, so where does that make the legs get? Oh, it's just yeah. so much to kind of think about. Um, <clears throat> I've got a, a commission coming up this year for a football club in Scotland called Queen of the South, and I'm creating three life-size players uh, from their distant past, past and present. Uh, so all three of them are going to do from the same log, yeah. looking outwards, and they'll each have a foot back on a football, and it'll be the same football. So oh. It's kind of connection yeah. with the, the three of them, and uh, so I'm looking forward to making it. But that that's a really challenging piece yeah. to do. Really challenging. Because um, I know you've you you're all starting to get a little bit more experience doing um, like people sculptures. Mm. I know you've done one of my favourite bands, the Beatles. Ah, uh, yeah. Back in Liverpool, where you're doing um, all the well, obviously everyone mm. in the Beatles, and you were up at the Liverpool Docks for quite a while doing them. Yeah, that was do you know that 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 was a really good experience. I I challenged myself to make each figure in six hours, oh. <laughs> and I I did it. I yeah. it was like I basically did one a day, um, over a period of four weeks. So I was working the Saturdays and and uh, yeah, that that was a really really good experience, and um, it was it made me. I think what that did was it really made me kind of analyze the human form even more to kind of uh really get a handle on um the uh the proportions more than anything and and uh choosing the wood as well so i used uh cedar uh, it was a big blue atlantic cedar that had, that had come down so i used that um because it cuts really quick but it does take a finish um and also not going too much into detail because yeah. i was i was using um <clears throat> my determination was to just use chainsaw and obviously you can get small chainsaws you know yeah. it goes down to quite a deep a small thing but when you're getting down to that sort of size it's like you've got to you've got to decide when to stop because it you can and it's working out how to capture character with a few lines as opposed to how to um uh, go into ultra fine detail to make it look like the person it, it's just just about capturing the character. So, so is, there, is there a process when you, because I know you must get loads of people ringing up saying, oh, I've got another tree that's coming down in a couple of weeks to on mm. the trunk. Is there a process that goes into it where over the last 12 years you're able, you're able to determine a good trunk versus a bad <laughs> trunk, for instance? <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, to be honest, that, that's my, our background has made yeah. a massive difference with that because I can look at an oak log and go, eh, there's brown rot in that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's like you see those telltale kind of like uh almost 
pixelated yeah. brown patches with the white streaks through it. You got that like fluffy fungus that grows up through it. And um, yeah, so that's made a massive difference. Uh, sometimes you can't see it. So I've spent out on an oak trunk before, which I've had to discard because there's been a big patch of brown in the middle and uh, and it's I, I just yeah. can't use it. So um, I've had a few times when uh, something's looked all right from the outside, yeah. but yeah, you get in. Um, so so learn my art background has made a massive difference as to how I see wood and and also how long it lasts as well. So I'll I'll point blank refuse to do something from horse chestnut or birch, for instance, unless it's going indoors because it's a waste of time. Yeah. It just rots really quick. Um, so I, I'm on the lookout for oak, cedar, western reds, redwood, all of those long-lasting timbers. <laughs> all the lovely, really expensive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but I've been... I, it's been fairly good recently. I, I've been fairly consistent on not going over 10% materials costs yeah. on any commission, um, which is my my aim, really. Yeah. So it's about it's probably about right in terms of uh, profit margins and stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, if it's a really special piece of wood and it's going to be really expensive, I'll, I've got an idea now about what to look for and, and go, okay, well, I'm going to have to increase the price on the commission because... It's got to include, include that, however much it is for the logs. Yeah, so we're talking about the materials that are used. Um, one of your one of the things that got us talking to each other is off on for still mm. basically. Yeah, I don't think it's wrong to basically say we're kind of both still fanboys. Um, we've got loads of still memorabilia. Mm. Yeah, I've been using still products since day one. Um, I know you've got your partnership with still. Mm. Um, what are the type of tools? Obviously, chainsaws, but what range of chainsaws are you using at the moment? Uh, so I tend to use. <clears throat> I always say to people, it's like a range of paintbrushes. You know, it's just like you use your big ones for the big cuts and all the rest of it. Um, but so I think what's important to me is have have a a good range between the saws. And I've realised over the years, I um, I don't go down in increments as much as I thought I did. Yeah. So at the moment, my I'd say my three key saws. If I was going to have if I was going to have a choice of three saws on a job, it would be the 462. Um, that is until I get my hands on a 500. <laughs> well, <laughs> that might... got... One of the things I've always been on to brag about, you're the first people to get one. Yeah. And all I could feel was, was this nice warm friendship yeah, that I was getting yeah. from you going, can I have it back? <laughs> I'm going to have some fast I've never sent you one first. Oh, uh, no. You're going to send us some scouts <clears throat> in <laughs> Well, yeah, I can do a review. Give it a sign. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's um, yeah, but that that's uh, yeah. I'll I'll get my hands on one at some point. Yeah, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, the five hundred I is uh, you know it's it's gonna blow everything out of the water really, and it really. But the yeah the four six two so somewhere around that kind of sixty to seventy cc range. Yeah, I I usually then drop straight down to two six one. Uh, so your your fifty fifty five cc yep, yep. kind of range that that's the that's my mid range saw. Um, I've usually got I usually have two of them because I've got one with a standard bar and one with a carving bar on it. Um, it's quite difficult to get carving bars on a two six one, yep. but um, there's a, there's a few people out there that do do ones that fit. Um, so I've got that and then. Uh, so that's going to be about a 16-inch bar on that. Yep. And then after that, I end up dropping down to the uh, cordless, uh, so the MSA 200, yep. um, with a, a smaller carving bar on it. Um, so I like to, uh, if I'm going to use anything in between, I've usually got uh, I've got a 362 as well, which, which is another intermediate one. Um, but if it's a massive piece of wood, um, I... The six six one comes out. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, it, nowadays I was talking to one of my colleagues a while ago. The six six one, it's lucky it comes out like three or four times a year because there's no really big timber in the UK yeah. anymore. No, it's like the four six two can pretty much tackle everything, and then yeah. of course the tree sage and standard saws the two six range. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, mm. well, that's 
So you're talking about saws that only come out once a year. Um, the the eight eighty was is prime for that, isn't it? I mean, I I, I ended up. Um, I've I, only ever picked up an eight eighty once, and that was <clears> the APF when it was up in Canic, and yeah. I've gone years ago. Never seen one since. Never yeah. heard of another tree surgeon using one. I've had one. I've I've always had one. <clears throat> and uh, but the reason I've had one is that there's been a couple of jobs where I've I've needed that power. But yeah. to be honest, at the time, if I'd have had a if I'd have had a six six one at the time, mm. I would have gone to that. Um, getting on to the Arb Show, you're going to be there this year in partnership with Still. Yeah. Um, is there any other events that you're doing this year? Yeah, I'm doing a few events that are overseas. Uh, I'm also doing some. I um, uh, got down in. Um, I can't even remember where it is now. I should know. Uh, Berkshire, I think it is. Yeah. Um, there's a a sculpture garden exhibition, basically that I'm I'm submitting a couple of pieces to, and 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 they'll 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 be there for a couple of weeks. Um, but the the overseas events I'm doing, I'm going over to um, uh, Holland real old Holland in the center of the Netherlands um, to do an event there uh, at the beginning of May. Um, and I've then got a, an event in Germany uh, at the beginning of June. That's this massive one called the Husky Cup. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that one. It's dragons. That's the theme dragons. again. Oh, you've, you've <clears> it's just, easily. it's just, it's the year of dragons. <laughs> and it was always a, it was always a competition. I've yeah. been going there, on and off for the past 12 years now. but It was always a competition, but they stopped it being a competition because it was getting to the point where it starts to get difficult to judge when a theme is imposed on you or a specific carving is imposed yeah. on you because um, you're, you're limited to that particular carving. So um, I was... Uh, uh, the This year, the dragon theme... We're actually doing it in teams of two, and I'm going to be working with my mate KG Kidakoro from Japan uh, to produce a dragon. And wow. it's like you get two massively different styles of yeah. dragon to kind of meld into one. So we're looking to do like a a combination of Eastern and Western dragon. Yeah, I'm gonna say because uh, you've got the Chinese dragon, obviously, because <clears> the, yeah. the dragon in China, um, sorry, over in Japan is huge. Yeah, and then you got like the our version of the dragons, which yeah. is new, different fire breathing things. So yeah, yeah, really yeah. Interesting yeah. That yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Uh, KG and I get on really well. Mm. You know, so <laughs> there's a big language barrier there, obviously, but um, yeah. it's like we, we kind of speak the same language in art. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. he's, um, uh, he's really good. He's the one who invited me over to Japan the last two times I've been. Yeah. And uh, we've yeah we've worked together before, so it should be really good. Really looking forward to it. So that's like a week long event. That's mm. like hard graft carving. <laughs> that is um, the oak logs he's got, like five foot diameter, uh, sort of yeah, massive things um, that so this if, guy's going. If people were looking to get into carving, because I know a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast mm. and the music, going to pick up the chainsaw, find a bit of timber in the yard. And go and create the mushroom just like you did. What advice and what tips could you would you be able to offer someone starting out? I'd say, <clears throat> I mean, I've always said, okay, it's 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 great to kind of start with the chainsaw and talking talking to the art world. You know, you're dealing with people who've been through the course yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, so that's great. You know how to use the chainsaw safely. Learning how to carve is using it in a completely different manner because you, it's it's almost like you. You have to relearn in some respects because you're using it upside down, you're using it on its side. You, there's so many different kind of angles that you're starting to use it at. And one of the temptations is to overreach. One of the other temptations is to start using the, the tip of the saw without kind of realizing and you, you kind of... Because <clears throat> because what goes out of your head is, is the tool that you're using sometimes yeah. when you're focusing on the actual shape. So what I'd say to everybody is just be really careful about um, maintaining the the you know maintaining using all the parts of the saw that you'd normally use and not the kickback zone and yeah. stuff like that. That's that's one of the main things. The other thing is um, uh, choose your subject matter. Um, if you're gonna do 
carving of an owl, for instance, which is the most popular carving by far. <laughs> Like mushrooms and owls. And mushrooms and, bears and owls well. and bears. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in America, it's bears and eagles, yeah. and over yeah. here, it's mushrooms and owls mainly. And the um, that that is, it's the staple kind of carving you start with. But I'd say don't look at other people's carvings of owls. Look at owls. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like they, do do you observation on something that's real as opposed to, you know, and it takes to print out a bunch of photos of a of of an owl from lots of different angles then that's the way to go at it as opposed to looking at how somebody else has carved an owl it ends up like chinese whispers and <laughs> soon, soon doesn't it goes from looking like an owl to more of a pigeon <clears throat> yeah 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 you start making all their mistakes you know yeah. and taking them on so so is there anything that you've been thinking one day i'm going to actually go out and carve carve something or you carved everything that you've wanted to so far? Oh, there's still tons of stuff that I want to do. Um, I I think having done the dragon like I've done the dragon at the moment, I'd love to do uh, an absolutely massive one, but actually really have the time to build it up yeah. in the right way. Because um, you're kind of you're constricted by... Um, you're constricted by the strength of the wood in a lot of respects, but you're also constricted by time and budget as well. So to actually go ahead and carve a 15, 20 foot dragon yeah. out of pieces that, that kind of has moving parts as well, because this is another thing I really love to do is include more moving parts on, on some more of my sculptures. So is it a hemlock? <clears throat> Yeah, moves, it? yeah, it kind so of snakes like from side aspect. to side, yeah. and I love that kind of aspect yeah. of something being more interactive as well. So um, I, I'm waiting for a. I had a job cancelled um, with uh, after I made the Dragon of Bethesda. Bethesda Software yeah. got in touch with me, uh, so they're the ones who make Skyrim and 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 games like that, you know. Oh. So like mega books yeah. that they've got to spend on stuff <laughs> and they were actually all ready and basically it got canned just before they sent the purchase oh. order out to me <clears throat> i was going to be doing um uh, a character from an upcoming computer game that they're releasing and um <clears throat> i i think i can I could probably say I had to sign an nda but it was mainly for the concept artwork yeah. that sent me they're re-releasing <laughs> doom and, no <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, so yeah, that's gonna be um, that's gonna be amazing. But I I was gonna be carving the main character from that, and that's what right. I would have been doing right now. <laughs> but instead, I get to come, to come here and on. talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, <clears throat> would have been ace. It would have been amazing. Yeah. But they want to work with me in the future, and they've got Definitely. they've got some other upcoming games which they. They want to kind of get me in on. So we're lots of you in the future. We might be able to be able to get like a bit, a couple of quids to go and get like a little miniature all things all logo made up. Just for the yeah, sense yeah, of yeah, these. yeah. Well, so we can sort that. I'm sure. <laughs> Simon, um, so where can people get in touch with you? So you can get in touch with me. Uh, he Google my name is probably the easiest thing to yeah. do. <laughs> Just like so, yeah. Dragon Wales. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, my my website's treecarving.co.uk. I've I've, I've just renewed that actually i've just had a new site built so um that's that's looking a bit more swanky now got some more up-to-date pictures on there uh and yeah so other than treecarving.co.uk i've got all the social media streams yep. um i should have been more consistent with me uh handles on social media I really <laughs> well i i've got at tree carving on twitter yeah that's good on. so that's great but at tree carving on Insta was taken, so I ended up with that Simon O'Rourke, and that's fine. That's my name. I, I can deal yeah, yeah. with that. But it's like, uh, I've actually yeah. So at tree carving on Twitter and at Simon O'Rourke on Insta, um, and Facebook, you can just uh, type my name in or yeah. type tree carving in, and you'll find me. And at live events this year, we've got the Arb Show in May. So we've got the Arb Show in May. Um, we've got uh, the 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 live events overseas are the the Husky Cup in yep. June. That's the beginning of June uh, over near Dresden in Germany. We've got the um, I've got a small event in Bavaria at the beginning of July. Um, 
and I've got a, a big event in um, in the middle of Germany near yep. Erfurt at the end of July. Uh, that's a really exciting one because I've had to get a three piece band together. I so I'm <laughs> I, I, so I'm playing bass and vocals. I normally play guitar. Um, I've got Luke Chapman, a carver from down south. He's yep. going to be guitars and vocals. I've got my apprentice Paul, who's a grade eight drummer so he's going to be joining us on drums so we've got a three-piece carvers band together and we're going to be called the sprockets <laughs> so that'll be ace the the uk live show i've got coming up in august is the english open chainsaw carving competition yep. so which i'm back at after having a three three year break from um so i'm back in on that one so looking forward to that that's at the cheshire game and country fair uh in tabley on the august bank holiday so. Simon, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. No worries. Pleasure. Cheers.